God just laid this on my heart that we need to be walking through 1 Peter because 1 Peter is all about Peter, which is one of the closest disciples of Jesus, talking to believers who had been persecuted after Jesus died and was resurrected, and they were being persecuted, and they were they were basically scattered all over the place like exiles, and they were suffering, and they were feeling persecuted, and it just felt like God said, we can learn something from this, because we are feeling many of us pressed, many of us squished, many of us feeling a little persecuted, maybe you're feeling like you're going through some kind of personal trial or just a general trial that everyone's going through, and there's something in this that's going to be helpful. So we are on to the section... Uh, in chapter 2, starting in verse 4, we're going to read through verse 12 and then go back and unpack it. And I'm just going to say at the outset that I've been arguing with God about this for like two days. About this, because some of you, I hope you're not going to be bored, but, but I felt like God said I needed to walk through like some of the terms and vocabulary and things that we just tend to skim over and like maybe you don't even know what that word means. And so I'm going to actually unpack some of the words. So bear with me if you're like, this is so elementary. Well, sorry. Uh, because I feel like we shouldn't just be skipping over things. We should actually know what they mean. So anyway, here we go. Let's start in 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Yes? verse 4. It says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, Jesus is referring, Jesus is referred to as a living stone because he is alive, and Jesus is the building block or the, the strong foundation, the solid foundation upon which God has built his church. And his church is his spiritual house where his family of adopted children live forever. So Jesus is that solid rock foundation. Verse 5. You yourselves, you, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So when we declare Jesus Christ as our Lord and Master and our Savior, God says we also become these living building blocks of God's spiritual house where his presence actually dwells. What does God mean when he says we've become a holy priesthood? Never thought I'd be a priest, right? Maybe you didn't either, maybe not, but not a priest. Well, in the time before Jesus came to earth, only the high priest got to go into the inner sanctuary of the temple behind the veil. Only the, the high priest got to go into where God's presence was dwelling. But now God says Jesus has made a way for each one of you to go directly into Amen. God's presence. Pretty cool. And what is this spiritual sacrifice business? What is this spiritual sacrifice that the Father is requesting from us? Well, Hebrews 13, 15 makes it clear that God desires us to praise him and do good to others as our spiritual sacrifice. That is our spiritual sacrifice. Listen to what it says in Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Through him, Jesus... 
then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So we're supposed to be entering his presence, have the privilege of entering his presence, the privilege of entering God's presence, and then he says, and all I want from you is that you would praise my name. I think I can do that. Praise my name, acknowledge him, and do good to others. That is our spiritual sacrifice. We can do that. We can do that. Verse 6. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So what is Zion? I know some of you are like, I know I learned this when I was in third grade in Awana. But I'm just going to tell you, for those of you who don't know, Zion is a reference to the coming kingdom of God, the new holy city established here on earth after Jesus comes back to earth to retrieve his followers. Zion is going to be that new holy city. And what is this cornerstone that he's talking about? What is a cornerstone? We just sang the song, Cornerstone. It's like, what is that all about? A cornerstone is the first and most pivotal stone if you're building a stone structure. It's the stone, that's the stone that sets everything in order. It is essential. So God is making clear that faith in Jesus is absolutely essential if you want to be part of God's spiritual house and his coming kingdom in the holy city of Zion. If you build your foundation on anything else but Jesus, such as being a really good person. Haven't you heard that before? Well, I, she's such a good person. Of course she's going to go to heaven. Doesn't matter. You could be the best environmentalist ever and save the earth. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not even making fun of that, but I mean, you could like be like just committed to clearing out the ozone or whatever it is, you know, and, and saving the spotted owls or whatever you do, and, and you'd be like, and people could be like, she's so amazing. Wouldn't matter. Wouldn't matter at all. You have to have Jesus as your solid foundation. Yes. Faith in Jesus keeps us securely connected to God the Father. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 2, starting in verse 19. So that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Yeah. Isn't that kind of exciting that we are God's dwelling place? That the God that created a bajillion stars, which is more quantity than the national spending bill. You know, so that's 3.5 trillion. But like, more stars than 3.5 trillion stars. I mean, I don't know why I had to weave that in there. Anyway, that's a little other thing. But it's like, he created a bajillion stars. This God says, I want to make my home in Jennifer. I want to make my home in Nancy. I want to make my home in Sierra. I want to make my home in Tanya. I want to make my home in Nicole. He says, that's pretty cool that he would dwell in us. Verse 7 and 8. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. The Jewish people 2,000 years ago, they rejected Jesus as Lord and they were offended by him. Just like back then, those today who refuse to acknowledge Jesus as the essential cornerstone to gain entry to heaven will try to make it to heaven on their own. They'll be so good. They'll do so many good things and, 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 and they'll just be good people and nice people. But that doesn't matter. If they reject Jesus, they will not make it into through heaven's gate. They will fall short. Those who refuse to follow Jesus will be outraged and offended that they didn't get to make it in. Right now you have friends who are offended if you say that Jesus is the way. Have, have you ever met someone like that? It kind of takes offense that I have to believe in Jesus. People, if God says it right here, they will take offense. It'll be a stumbling block and offense. In fact, God makes it clear in his word that many will try to manipulate and alter his word to please themselves instead of truly obeying Jesus. 
and we cannot fall into that trap. There are denominations that are altering the Word of God to make it more palatable, easier, tolerant, all those buzzwords. Listen to what it says in 2 Timothy 4. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. We have to be so careful. Even in today's Christian culture, there are some who are diluting the scripture, starting to twist what God really said. Be careful. For instance, God never said in the Bible that we should tolerate sin. He never said, he, he never talks about tolerance of sin. And yet there are whole denominations that preach tolerance of sin. I'm just saying we have to be really careful. This is not me talking, this is what the Bible says. We have to be so careful to test absolutely everything. If what I'm talking about, even though we have the verses up on the screen, you need to be testing, you need to be looking it up. Is this what, is this what the Bible really says? Test everything so you don't get pulled off course. Verse 9, the first part of verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. What is he talking about here? What does God mean by chosen race? If you recognize Jesus as Savior and Lord, that means God has chosen you. He's, he's chosen to open your spirit to who he is, and you've become part of a special group of people. You're a chosen people. What does God mean by royal priesthood? He has given you the amazing privilege as his adopted child of entering his presence anytime you want. Remember I talked about how back in the day the high priests were the only ones who could go into his presence? Now you're part of this royal priesthood. You get to go in anytime. Right now, like, Lord, talk to me through your Holy Spirit. I know you're right inside of me. It's like, boom, right there. That's how close he is. You're part of that royal priesthood. What does God mean by holy nation? That you're a holy nation. God has designated you as belonging to his family, which is set apart, which is what the word holy means. You are set apart. You're purified from our ungodly culture. And what does God mean by a people for his own possession? Again, God has adopted you as his beloved, treasured child, and he possesses you now in the family. You cannot be taken away. Hallelujah. The rest of verse 9, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. As God's child, he's calling you to tell others about all he's done for you, about his marvelous love and grace and mercy and power, how extravagant he is, how kind he is, how he just, he does like God winks at you all the time. Have you ever had a God wink? Have you ever experienced what I call a God wink? It happened, can I just, I, I just like to brag about God because he's just so awesome. So we have this little thing, God and I, going on. I don't know. It's just like a thing. It's just for us, apparently. But I pray about the weather. Because it started years ago. I think I was going to the Northwest Washington Fair. I had a little booth, you know, the Debbie Chavez podcast. I was on. Anyway, and it was supposed to rain. I'm like, oh. And I remember praying, like, Lord, don't let it rain. It'll ruin everything. And it didn't rain. And then I just started praying for the weather after that. Whenever there was like an event, it was our Easter sunrise service. Lord, I know the forecast says rain, but please stop the rain. I need to stop the rain. And, and so this last week, I traveled over to eastern Washington. The forecast was horrid. And we were pulling this gigantic trailer, which already makes me nervous, right? And, and the forecast was like pouring rain in Bellingham, pouring rain in Everett, pouring rain in Soquelmie Pass, pouring rain in Spokane. I'm like, this is going to be bad. Lord, I need you to just move all the weather systems out of the area. In Jesus' name. That's about how eloquent that prayer was. And guess what happened? No rain. I'm just saying, like, God waits. Like, I don't even know why I'm telling this story. But, but because we're supposed to tell about all of his excellent deeds, we're supposed to be bragging about how awesome the Lord is. Verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you were a spiritual orphan who did not belong. Have you ever felt like that? that you were kind of an orphan, that you just didn't belong, but now you have been adopted into God's family. You do belong. Isn't that the best feeling ever, to belong? God says you belong. Romans 8, 15, So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him 
Abba, Father. And that Abba is just like this really rich, intimate, close term of endearment. Like Papa, you know, it's just that really close family relationship. He's, his, he's our loving daddy. The rest of verse 10. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. You know, in the past, you might have been weighed down by sin, regret, shame, but God in his great mercy has washed your sins and shame away. He doesn't even see your sin anymore. He doesn't even see it anymore. He's like, what are you talking about? And some of you keep on dragging it back and beat yourself over the head. And if I hear one more person say, I can't forgive myself, I'm going to yeah. just scream. Because it's like, how about if you just come in agreement with God? He says, I don't even know what you're talking about. Stop bringing it up. I don't, I don't even see it anymore. So if you are coming into this building today filled with shame, I'm just saying, like, just throw it off your back. Jesus says, I have come to wipe that all away, and I don't even see it anymore. Here's the verse, Isaiah 43, 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. Come on. Yeah. If he's forgotten it, could you come into alignment with that and say, right. I mean, every once in a while, I'm just going to be honest, the devil comes to me and says, remember what you did, baby. And I'm having to go like, yeah, but that's the old person. I don't even know what you're talking about. Boom, get out of here, right? Like, I mean, right? We have to, Don't accept that. God has forgotten it. You can too. Verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. You know, you're going to feel like a foreigner or an exile living in our godless culture because you don't belong here. <laughs> because your real citizenship is with God's family in heaven. But be aware that our godless culture and the devil will continually try to entice you to betray your devotion and obedience to Christ. He's going to try to tempt you with all sorts of pleasures of the flesh. And you and I must constantly be on alert for that whole, those enticements, those temptations. 1 Peter 5, very familiar. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. Where is the devil trying to pull you off course? Where is he trying to pull you off course? What comes to mind when I even ask that question? I bet you it doesn't take long for you to go, yeah, yeah. Maybe even jot in just a little note for yourself, though. Like, where is the devil trying to pull you off course from obedience to Christ, to devotion to Christ? Where is that? Could be subtle. Could be big. We have to be aware. And verse 12, our final verse. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day of visitation. You know, Gentiles were the people outside of God's family. They were basically, usually unbelievers, who were, again, not part of God's family. And God is asking us to do our best every day to imitate the behavior of Christ so that unbelievers can't find anything bad to say about us or about God. Perhaps our behavior will actually influence them to find Christ for themselves and gain entry to heaven. So that's just kind of walking through those passages, but now I just want to spend a couple of minutes. I was praying about, like, Lord, there's a lot here, but what are the two things? If we were just to boil it down, Lord, the two things. What are you trying to tell us today? And there could have been many things we could focus on, but these are the two things that he brought to mind. First of all, you have a huge role and three exciting purposes in God's kingdom. First, you are God's dwelling place, you know, living stones of his house, and the vessel from which to display himself to the world. That's who you are. You're his dwelling place and the vessel from which he displays himself to the world. What a huge role. And here's the analogy he gave me. It's like the ultimate fixer-upper show on TV. <laughs> it's like the ultimate fixer-upper show on TV. We used to be a house in shambles. We were just in shambles. Sarah knows about a house in shambles. We were a house in shambles, but then God came in and flipped the house, right? He flipped the house. He cleaned out the garbage. He built this beautiful new interior. He moved in, and now he's asking you to invite others for the big reveal. Like, you know, like, and what do they see when they look at this house where he's dwelling, right? Kind of makes me think, I want to keep my house tidy. <laughs> what about you? I mean, like, I want to keep my spiritual house tidy because it's a showcase. 
it's the big reveal. After the fixer-upper has come through, like, what do they see when they look at my spiritual house? I want to keep it tidy. I want to keep it peaceful. I want to keep it comfortable. Not pretentious, not arrogant, just loving and comfy, and, right? Mm -hmm. I want to do that. I want to be that kind of showcase for God's house. How can we be sure that God will make over our house and move in and dwell there? Well, this happens when we truly seek to honor and obey Jesus. That's when it actually happens. When we truly seek to honor and obey Jesus. Why do I know that? Some of you know this verse from our Experience in God class, if you ever took this. John 14, 23. Jesus said, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Amen. I love that verse. But did you catch that it's if you obey Jesus, then he comes and makes his home in us. Have you ever noticed there are a lot of if-then clauses in the Bible? If-then promises? God is asking us to do something. And then, wait for it, wait for it, he comes and builds his house in us. But we have to be in obedience. When we do our best to honor and obey Jesus, we get to have God's Holy Spirit living in us. And that's pretty cool. The Bible says the Spirit comforts us, he guides us, he counsels us. He convicts us when we go off course. He speaks truth to us. We get all of that when we seek to honor and obey Jesus. And by the way, this means if you do not sense that God is residing in you, that might be a good reason to do like a check. Like, Lord, is there something where I am deliberately out of obedience with you? Point that out to me. Because we should have that sense. Not like, you know, it's not like I can rip my chest up and go, hey, I see you in there, thanks. I mean, but I mean, we should have a sense that God is living in us. And if we don't sense that, it probably is time for a check. Like, Holy Spirit, show me if I'm out of obedience somewhere. Okay, our second purpose, you are to boldly and without shyness proclaim God's goodness and his wonderful deeds to those in your circle of influence. This is about you know, proclaiming the excellencies of him. 2 Corinthians 2.14, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. Are you looking for every opportunity to spread the beauty of Jesus to those around you? Or are you more focused on self and your own interests like the rest of the world? Are you hanging back out of shyness or fear of what will other people think? Or are you stepping out into this fulfilling role that God has for you as ambassador? This came home for me when I was over at the lake house this last week, and we were doing a lot of work. We were exhausted by the time we got done. But a couple of family members came over, a couple of little grandkids came over for the weekend. And, you know, I had so much to do. Have you ever been that woman who's so busy, like the Martha woman? I have so much to do. I'm trying to still build bunk beds with my husband, and, and we're still taking stuff to the dump. And so I'm, like, so busy. And then these two little kids want to go down to the dock and play in the water. I'm like, ah, okay, fine. Have you ever done it like that? And you're like, yes, I'd love to take it down to the dock. I have so much to do. But I'm like, okay, I'll go down to the dock. And so I'm down there with three of my grandkids, an 11-year-old and a 4-year-old and a 3-year-old. And they're playing in the water, and I'm like looking at my watch, like, oh, I have so much to do. And so I'm just like, oh, yeah, yeah, good, yeah. Uh -huh. mm. uh, and then God finally broke through to Jeffy Chavez. He's like, yes, he hit me over the head with a brick, but he's like, what are you doing? And I heard him say, it's not about you, it's about every moment. How are you expanding the kingdom of God? And I went, oh, perspective shift, perspective shift, perspective shift. And so in a blink of an eye, it was like, I need to have a spiritual conversation with these kids. Because you know what? What if I was gone tomorrow? I would regret that I had not had a spiritual conversation with these children. I mean, not that I've never talked. I've talked to them about, about God before. But it was like, I want to make the most of every opportunity. So instead of me looking at my watch and going, ha, 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 yeah. uh, don't draw on each other, you know, things like that, um, I, I turned the conversation and said, like, oh, you know, for the three-year-old, you know, who made the sky? You know, and, you know, they figured out. God, and you know, the four year old, you know, who made the water? God, and then the 11 year old. Here was something kind of interesting. This is just an aside. Um, he goes to a Christian school, and so you'd think that he would really know about Bible application, but I learned something in this moment. You can have a lot of Bible knowledge and have never had anyone talk to you about application. So he's a brainiac, this 11 year old, and I so I asked him, I said, um, What's your favorite Bible story? And he kind of hemmed and hawed for a while, and finally came up with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I'm like, cool. I said, 
And so what is God trying to tell you through that story? And he looked at me like I had five heads. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, what is God trying to tell you through that story? I don't know. Well, why do you even like that story? I don't know. I like the names. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so have you ever thought about that maybe God's trying to talk to you through the Bible and teach you things? No, is what he said. And I thought, ding, 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 ding. And then I realized that God said, make the most out of every opportunity. So we talked about, well, what could that story possibly mean? Like, why would God want us to read that story? What is he trying to learn? And it was just a light bulb moment for me. I know I'm probably light years behind most of you who do this regularly. But for me, this was like, duh, perspective shift. It's not always about me and my agenda. It's like, how can I, how can I expand God's kingdom today? How can I, in this moment, with this group of people, in this circumstance, expand God's kingdom today? Huge perspective shift. Now I'm doing something important in eternity. And so the new question that we need to ask ourselves, this is the question. Lord, how can I be used to help expand your kingdom right now in this setting with these people? What if we ask that question every hour? What if we ask that question every hour? It would change everything. Now when I'm angry with my husband, which happens on occasion, um, I could like, instead of thinking about and how outraged I am about everything, blah, 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 I could be like, Lord, how do you want me to expand your kingdom with my husband in this moment? Now, that could mean that I'm supposed to set a boundary because he needs to learn about boundaries, or it could mean that I'm supposed to be gracious, or it could mean, I don't know what it could mean, but it's a perspective shift. Do you, do you, do you get that? If you get nothing else, I you get this. It's a perspective shift. How can I expand God's kingdom in this moment? Okay, our third role. Strive to always display integrity, kindness, and love to unbelievers in your life so that they too may, ex may come to accept Christ and join you in heaven one day. Titus 2. In everything, even with annoying people, set them an example by doing what is good in your teaching. Show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. I feel bad that people do have bad things to say about me. This is a convicting verse, like my neighbor. He's probably seen my glares. That is not really a good example, right? So it's like, and you might have some people in your life where you let your annoyances get the best of you, right? This means I need to pause. I need to pause and you need to pause when an unbeliever or actually anyone in your life is frustrating you, disappointing you, annoying you. We need to pause and ask God to show us how to be kind, gracious, loving in that moment, even if it is setting boundaries, doing it in a kind way means we need to not take unethical shortcuts at work when others are watching. I don't know, someone needed to hear that. When they're not watching, too. And when they're not watching, too. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> Here's the thing, and this is what I just wanted to kind of finish this little section. We often say, we often say that we want God to use us. Have you ever said that? I, I just want God to use me. I just want God to use me. But I just don't know what to do. I don't know what he's calling me to do. But he has told us. He just told you three things. Did you catch that? He just told you three specific things. You're to do your best to honor and obey Jesus so that God can make his home in you. You're to boldly tell others about the goodness of God. And you're to show integrity and kindness to unbelievers so they are drawn to Christ. And here's a convicting little tiny verse to just throw in there for good measure. John 13, 17. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And then our last little takeaway. You used to be alone. You used to be filled with shame. You used to be a spiritual orphan who was seeking to belong. But that is not your identity any longer because now you do belong. You are the adopted daughter of God, dressed in white, victorious over sin and shame, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, comforted and guided by Papa God, walking side by side throughout your day with Jesus as your best friend, sometimes pressed down but not destroyed because God is greater than the enemy. Amen? Amen? Come on. The question is, will you accept your true identity or do you talk smack about yourself? 
Will you accept your true identity? Or do you talk smack about yourself? Put yourself down. Label yourself incorrectly. The devil is constantly trying to egg you on to label yourself incorrectly. You're unlovable. You're stupid. You're clumsy. You're defeated. It's hopeless. Blah, 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 blah. Pack of lies. You used to be a hot mess, but that's not your identity anymore. Right? I mean, you, some of you, you might have used to be a hot mess, but that is not who you are anymore. You used to be hopeless, but that is not true anymore. You used to be alone, but that is not true anymore. You used to be fearful, but that is not true anymore. You used to be filled with shame, but that is not true anymore. God has made you into a new creation. <coughs> 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has what? Passed away! Behold, the new has come. Just like when you get married, you change your name. You take on a new identity. God says, I have taken you as my bride. Get rid of your old name. Just like when you get married. You discard the old name. You bring in the new. God's saying, get rid of your old name. You're married to me now. Don't keep your old driver's license. Cut it up to pieces, right? So what comes to mind when you think of just one word that goes with your old identity? I want you to write that down. One word that is that old identity, that used to be your identity. What's the one word that comes to mind? Write that down. That is not you anymore. That is not you anymore. I want you to put a line through that word. That is not you anymore. Now pause and ask God what your new identity is. What is a new word that comes to mind through the Holy Spirit right now? What is he saying to you right now that is your new identity? Just one word that he's speaking to you right now. What is that new identity? Write it down. That's who you are. Breathe that in. Speak that to yourself. In the morning when you get up, when you lay down at night, remind yourself, you are loved, you are beautiful, you belong, you are chosen. That is who you are. Amen? Amen. Yeah.